Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. The glass candles are burning, and you're listening to the Obsidian Knights Podcast. In today's episode of Obsidian Nights, where we go through A Song of Ice and Fire chapter by chapter, we are doing Eddard 2. The wolves have finally left Winterfell, and they're headed down the King's Road to the capital, King's Landing. And today's guest is Justin Thomas from Top Shelf Fandom. What's up, Justin? Do you want to let people know where they can find you? Absolutely. Top Shelf Fandom is my YouTube channel. Uh, make sure to subscribe. I cover just a uh, story, uh, s- trying to do it from more of a macro sense, uh, doing the big picture, looking at structure of story, um, doing critical analysis and uh, literary analysis is something that I'm very fond of. And I can't thank you enough for having me on. You are, of course, uh, not only just somebody that I enjoy personally, but somebody that I respect within this uh, business and within this genre, especially. And I'm just loving myself this uh refreshment of that long night juice that you have been providing because there's nothing better than reading a Son of Ice and Fire proper along with Gray Area for this companion podcast that is so spectacular and I'm honored to be on it. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So everyone that's listening to this podcast, if you're listening on Apple or wherever you're listening, please leave me a review. Let me know how I'm doing. I'm trying to hit a hundred reviews. Is that a damn ridiculous number? No, it's, it's a reasonable number. They better all be five stars, but it's it's reasonable. It's good. It's, they, it, it's the way you want to They don't go. need to be five stars. You just need to be honest and mm-hmm. let me know how I'm doing. Meaning five stars. Because I don't want like... <laughs> I don't want like false reviews so I need to know like if I need to improve. So if you're watching this in visual format, please like, comment, and share. But anyway, now that all that's out the way, this chapter has a ton of things to unpack. Like a ton. Let, let, let's just jump right into the juice. So while the King and the Lannisters and the Starks are traveling to King's Landing, they're making stops along the way. I mean, from Winterfell to King's Landing, it's it's not a short trip. It's a, it's actually like I looked it up. It's about sixteen hundred miles. It takes about a month for Robert to get to Winterfell. So they ride, they stop, they camp. They ride, they stop, they camp. So in Eddard Two, they have camped in the Barrowlands. They're still in the north. So the Barrowlands is south of Winterfell, south of Torren Square, but north of Moat Kalen. The Barrowlands are ruled by House Dustin, Lady Barbara Dustin, Queen that she is not. And Barrow Town is a vassal of House Stark. So Robert comes in, it's like dawn. It's, it's before dawn. He wakes Ned up. Um, he's like, let's go. We have matters of state to discuss. They get on their horses and they ride away from everyone. So it's just Ned and Robert on their horses. Well, there is actually some Kingsguard there, but they're like way behind them in the distance. Like they can't hear what they're talking about. I feel like they make a big point. I'm sorry to like really emphasize how Robert is up on his steed first. And he's demanding of Ned to come out in this, in, in, in this, you know, at, at, at the break of dawn, right? At dusk, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> whatever the proper word is for it. But it's cold, it's dark, and he's awakened by Alan and called, and he says there's matters of state. And then that's like how he entices Ned to get on. And then as we'll get to, there's nothing really, I mean, there's matters of state, but there's also gossip and tea being spilt. Yeah, lots of tea. So the Barrowlands um, and Ned and Robert having this discussion in the Barrowlands gives me the heebie-jeebies. So the Barrows are actually like mass graves. They are these mounds and hills of graves. So Ned Stark says that they're ancient first men graves. So burrows are a real world thing. There are many places you can actually find burrows still today like all over the world. It's common burial practice in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age 
Angelo Saxon conquest age, but like the Bronze Age and the Iron Age is what influenced the Children of the Forest was definitely Bronze Agey, and the um, Iron Age is definitely like First Men, uh, Andals coming to Westeros kind of thing. So it's another thing that George is drawing on, but it's what Robert says that gives me the chills. Ned pointed them out to his king. The barrels of the first men. Robert frowned. Have we ridden onto a graveyard? Chills. Yes, that, that's what I think I didn't I didn't convey correctly earlier is what like is him going off into, you know, this cold um and following Robert into his grave essentially. You know, like yeah. metaphorically, you know, per, yeah, yeah, like they're they're both riding into their death. They're both riding into a graveyard. They both will be dead soon. It totally feels like a setup. Like, it totally feels like foreshadowing. And they'll go there disagreeing with each other. <laughs> like, they will go there in the way in which they did. Like, this is, they're not on steady ground. They're on hollow, unsteady ground. But he still will follow him. Ned will follow Robert, right? Yeah, that's a good fucking point. Like, they aren't. Like, we're going to find out through this chapter, like, we already got, like, a taste of it, right? In Winterfell, in Eddard 1, where they were down in the crypts, and they don't really, like, Robert is this one representation of the South where he is cheery and happy, he likes to drink, he likes to fuck, and Ned is just, like, this cold man where laughter freezes in his throat in the North, and they're just so different. And it's like that whole chapter is screaming, do not go. And this one is doing the same fucking thing. And Ned, like this is a chapter where Ned starts to doubt going to King's Landing. And we see so many more layers to it because I tried to really put myself in the mindset and it wasn't hard. I, I, I learned to turn myself up emotionally and intellectually a long time ago in, in experience, say films that have been adapted and so forth. So like I tried to forget everything I knew about the series. Well, one of the reasons I've been preaching about this podcast especially is because we've gone through this period in which we had the times in which we were looking forward to the tv show and maybe we shouldn't have been looking forward to the tv show so much but rereading these chapters i've tried to isolate myself uh from the you know conceptualization of this story uh going through it meaning like trying to separate my emotions and my my already you know known facts about this story which i've done pretty well uh through doing like any review of anything that's been adapted and tried to isolate myself and think what do i know about ned by chapter 12 right by Ned too. Right. And there is so much spilled here because before this, the whole issue has been, yes, you get the whole, what it means from being from the North, what it means from not being from the North, you know, from being with Prince Joffrey and all these different ideals and values in which they share. And then we get a little bit of the spice with the East there. But at this point, we, we learn to realize that in this chapter, it's not just the issue of what Jamie and Cersei have going on, or even pushing Bran out the window, that there's this pre-existing strife within these two families, the Lannisters in the Starks. Right. You know, like, and it just adds on to it. And for me, I thought, as a, if I was a first-time reader, would I think, does Ned have an extra agenda because of these issues? Yeah. And I told, and I think he does. Like, if you actually, like, if you actually look at it, he does have an agenda but it's mainly the agenda that's presented and not necessarily and there's a lot going on in the background so one thing about a song of ice and fire is that exposition can be dumped on you right without it feeling like an exposition dump so that's kind of what this chapter is like to me, that's hard to do, right? It takes some finesse um, to pull that off. Like, look at all the things that he's woven into this single conversation between Robert and Ned. We get exposition on Jon Snow's mother and Rhaegar, the Targaryens, the Trident, the Lannister, Robert's Rebellion, Lyanna, Jorah, Varys, Brandon Stark, Rickard Stark. Like, there's so much. And he's woven it all into, like, this very relevant 
conversation. Because besides the times in which, the one time in which he's in the crypt with Robert before, this is the first time in which they have been truly alone and able to speak as brothers. And I don't know if anybody's ever gotten back together with an old friend or girlfriend, boyfriend, anything. You, you, you exposition does get spewed. And I think that's what's so natural about it because they have nothing else but to say, this is what happened back the last time we were together, whether it's the nine years ago or the 14 years ago, whether it's Greyjoy time or, you know, time of Robert's rebellion. But we see the packing on of, you know, doubt about the Lannisters, but we also see a lot of moralistic and all these ethical issues with Ned as well. Ned is just so stark, all puns intended, about killing Jorah, you know, for taking those poachers and, and selling them into slavery. But then he wants to not have anything to do with the killing of Targaryens. I know we'll get into it, but it really shows Ned's hand. And this is the chapter that really, I mean, I'm sure if you went back and you did the research uh, to find the first like semblance of R plus L equals J, it starts right. This is when it becomes Chekhov's gun. It starts in, in Catelyn's chapter when she brings up Ashara and she brings up the Tower of Joy and all that and how he came back with John. And then it's brought, that is the first thing that Robert asked Ned about. John? Yeah. Um, it, so it's important, right? It's important. It's an important part of the dynamic between Robert and Ned. Like, this is his best friend, but his best friend has a serious flaw. If his best friend knew that his nephew was a Targaryen, his best friend would kill him. And a lot of what Ned projects on Daenerys is how he feels about John. So Ned is speaking about Daenerys, but he's also he re really can relate to the situation in a way that no one else can because he knows that he has raised a secret Targaryen. But I will say for like all the N plus A equals J believers, he did Martin, George R. R. Martin did leave like a little R plus A equals J breadcrumb because he doesn't want to be straightforward. So he did um, leave that breadcrumb and we'll, we'll get into that. We're just going to go in chronological order through the chapter. Yeah, if you if you look at this chapter isolated, as I'm trying to do. You, you have every reason because there's this love interest in which you've been alluded, it's been alluded to with Ashara, you know. Um, and so you have to think, okay, so who's he lying to? But also what interests me about this, and I'm gonna let you roll with it because it's your thing, but is that Robert, okay, they're gonna be vagabond knights. He says, you know, Ned, and, and uh, interestingly enough, this is not too far off from the show. At least this, yeah. this chapter. They don't go too far. I think it's Betsy instead of Bessie, uh, and so forth. But, you know, like the first thing that Robert does is he starts to kind of like press on Ned for, well, you're not so perfect yourself, Mr. Ideals there. You're not so great yourself, Mr. Honorable Stark. So I think it's a little bit of Rob trying, Bobby B trying to justify his actions because Ned has now followed his oath and he has traveled south, which never goes good for a Stark, right? To King's right. Landing. And um this is his duty, but Robert's looking at this as like this is his playhouse. This is his fun time with his pal. And he's like, hey, I do all this pretty much inexcusable stuff, but you haven't been perfect yourself. So I think that's why this exposition drop just kind of like adds up here because it might be something a guy would do, right? Because he feels Ned might be looking down upon him. And Ned had that Lannister connection with you know, he does think it's wrong to kill kids because of what Tywin did. Let's, before we get to that, let's go to what leads into that conversation. So what leads into that conversation is this quote. What do you say, Ned? Just you and me, two vagabond knights on the king's road, our swords at our sides and God knows what in front of us. And maybe a farmer's daughter or a tavern wench to warm our beds tonight. Would that we could, Ned said, but we have duties now, my liege, to the realm, to our children, I to my lady wife, and you to your queen. We are not the boys that we were. So before we get too far into it, I just want to say that there's this 
th th this thing, this established thing between Robert and Ned where they are <laughs> completely opposites. So Robert, like I said, represents the South, represents the fun things. And Ned is this hard guy that is like the stark reminder of duty and honor. And Robert just isn't. And it's highlighted every time they talk. Like Ned, Robert has these these whimsical ideas all throughout his chapters. And Ned is kind of like bringing him back down to earth but he can't do it because robert never fucking listens to him it, cersei is holding and literally holding like you talked about how long it takes to get from king's landing to winterfell like that he he cites this in this conversation like so ned looks at his he's being held back by robert from being honorable to his family right like he has to like leave for duty um, he has to, and he does kind of this, all the Starks go off in their path. Robert is like, okay, Ned, now you're my new John Aaron. So I am going to leave my duty with Cersei because she literally in her wagon, if that axle breaks one more time, I'm going to bounce and we can be vagabond knights. So they have totally different ideals. You're right about like what freedom is. Like right. w one thing, sir, at the McDonald's ball pit, Robert, and, and one thing, sir, in purgatory, Ned. Yeah. So I think the woman that Robert is talking about when like when, when um Robert's like when Ned's like, Oh, we're not those boys anymore, Robert's like, uh, you never were those boys. Like you never were. You were always a, a hard son of a bitch. But then he's like, There was that one time and I really think he's talking about Ashara Dane. He says God's love her black hair and these sweet big eyes you could drown in them so I'm wondering like so Robert is remembering her as one of his but I don't think so I don't think so because Robert like has had so many women at this at this point like he can't fucking remember he's not gonna distinguish. who's who and what's what like he can't yeah he can't distinguish it and we know that Ashardane had black hair and purple eyes. So you so, think he's probing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. Because he's, he's naming like all specifics. of these different people. Becca, like, Elena, Meryl, and Ned tells him like finally, Wyla. Yeah. Terrible name, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I guess if you're going to have to go convince your wife uh, of, of some lie, then Wyla would be the name you'd want to give. I apologize to any Wylas out there. Well, Wyla is the name of Jon Snow's milk mother, which we Ooh. learn later from Edric Dane. So, I mean, when people talk about him being a gardener, so many seeds are planted here. Yeah, so many. So many. So fast, too. Yeah, and... I I love it. So I love A Song of Ice and Fire because I feel like I can literally transport myself into this place. Like, and that's what good escapism is. Like, you can literally experience the story, like not just read it. So when they're describing, when Ned's describing the barrel lands, like you can see it. You feel like you're there. And it's just like it feels gloomy and uncomfortable yeah robert's uncomfortable. uncomfortable he literally i mean he's very disrespectful of the north and it, it makes you believe it's like was ned one of the last kings of i mean because he says up here are you doing nobody any damn good in this chapter you know it's well, like, wow. in this, <laughs> but in the south robert's not doing anybody any good like he's yeah literally ruining the entire realm like yeah we like we like robert he's funny he's a funny guy he's a fun loving guy like he he likes to drink he likes to have sex and all of these fun things but he should be ruling the realm and he's not he's went and got the most the person that is the least capable of this job like I love Ned Stark, love him to pieces, but I would never in a million years pick Ned Stark to be my hand over Stannis Baratheon. Never. Yeah, never. I, 
Well, I, and I think that's interesting because what we're for, uh, faced with here on like a, this ethical like conundrum in which they're in is that, you know, what is going to be proposed eventually is the killing of the Targaryens. And we see the different practices and methodology, you know, of you have right away the mention of Jorah. And by I just want to plan in here that we we come off a Danny chapter to get into this. And this is Danny's marriage night. So we definitely have empathy most likely sympathy for her. Um, so it's perfectly planted as the gardener does, uh, with your lineup of chapters right here, you know, but when we see Ned's, you know, what he is talking about, as you said, he's not like the one qualified for this job. So John Aaron is the one that has stopped Robert from doing a lot of these things. And now I think Robert is taking this ride out and I might be telling schools out of tale or tales out of school here. But I think that Robert is definitely like taking this ride out with Ned to like really test his morality here, you know, like to say, hey, why was it right for Liana to be raped by Rhaegar? And we'll get into it. Why was it right for this to happen? Ned's like, it, but it was right for Jorah to, you know, go and sell these people. So like it's these different like stances on what should be done. And you can see that Robert is totally fueled by emotion. And what he wants to do is get revenge. And that happened to land him on the throne. That's not ideal. Mm-hmm. And Ned is this idealist, this moralist, and he is now put in this place where you have, you know, John Aaron's uh, ward. Ned is very much so a, a surrogate son, as Robert is, very different, but of of Aaron, and he expects him to kind of be the moral compass, and is somebody that's more s- at least versed in this area of A Song of Ice and Fire, I wanted to ask you on this podcast, like, did John Aaron have any insight do you think big picture into this that he kept because i think that he's looking to unleash hell and you can see Varys is as well they're kind of timing this for jared for john aaron to go and know that robert's going to be kind of off the leash so did john aaron know anything no. i mean it's crazy to me no i don't think john aaron knew anything i think when he once he found out they killed him i mean when he found out about cersei and jamie they killed him so john aaron truly loved ned and robert he went to war to protect them yeah so he he's not going to war and risk his his life his house his lands his incomes his people to protect people that he doesn't care about so i definitely think he loves them and john aaron has ruled the realm very capably like he's he's managed to uh, the keep the realm from going to war in the big scheme of things. John Aaron is the one that talked Robert into marrying Cersei. That was good for Robert. That solidified his rule on the kingdom with the Lannister army, the Baratheon army, and the North and the East. Robert's rule was solid. So, do I think John Aaron had some master plan or knew something? No. Not about what I'm speaking about is Ned's secret. No. I, no. He just I wanted to prevent war. No one knew anything but Hal and Reed. Gotcha. And the people that were at the Tower of Joy. Like, that's my 100% belief. Yeah, I can see that. What what I got from this chapter as well is that we get more insight into now, like you spoke of, it was very, uh, you know, uh, pragmatic to put the Lannisters into this mix. But at the same time, it is rewarding bad behavior, right? Because they didn't answer the call on both sides, Targaryen loyalists and, you know, Robert's people. They approached the Lannisters and they didn't go until the very end until they had an assured winner and they totally, totally sandbagged. And to the end, and that type of behavior is rewarded, and that adds on to Ned's pre-existing issues. The Lannisters not joining the Mad King was a favor for Rob. Like that could be viewed as a favor. Yeah. Them not joining, like Tywin and the Mad King have always been best friends. Like I know some shit popped off, and they aren't speaking, but. The Lannisters not getting involved in that war was definitely a plus one for Robert. Whether they joined Robert or not, them staying neutral 
was a plus one for Robert, just like the veil staying neutral in the war of five Kings and not joining Rob was a plus one for the Lannisters. Yeah, it is, you know, they're, they're not their enemies, so it, it does work out, but it, it adds to the complexity of Robert's relationship with Cersei, uh, meaning the, the, the way in which he views that, uh, why he's so, you know, still intrigued by Lyanna, his one perceived love is, you know, the Cersei relationship was, you know, definitely a relationship of state. Yeah, definitely. No, nothing but. Not only do they not like each other, but they, there's never a pretense for them ever liking each other. Yeah, the, but I mean, their relationship was one of necessity. So um, we talked about Jorah a little bit, but so Jorah had this wife that he couldn't fucking afford. You know, he, he was living above his means and he caught some poachers on his land and he sold them to a Tyroshi slaver. So for this, Ned Stark wants him dead. He he wants to kill him. He's been, he's on the run. And we find out that he's spying on Daenerys for a royal pardon. I've, I'm 100% sure that Ned wants to kill Jorah even more <laughs> now that he's spying. <laughs> for and working for Varys because Ned doesn't like Varys. He doesn't trust the eunuch. Well, yeah, because Varys was there before. It's almost like the Tywin situation, you know, like it's just sitting back and not and just kind of waiting for who's going to come out on top and then and then backing that horse. It, and obviously, Varys, uh, there's a lot of, of questions with him. It is important to note that in the last chapter in which we see Jorah, Jorah gives Danny and apologizes for the books you know, being such a poor president, but it's the, the history of the Seven Kingdoms, kind of implying how much he wants to go home. And let's remember that Ned couldn't kill Jorah because of how long it took Ned's ass to get to Bear to Island. Bear Island. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, why do you think we're so impoverished, dude? He's like, oh, man, it took me forever to get here. And him being not having a uh, headman, you know, like like uh, Robert has. Him, you know, passing, you know, uh, the, the, the law and uh, doing the deed himself. He's like, it took me forever to get here. He's like, yeah, that's why we're so poor, bro. Yeah. So, like, the main matter of state that Robert wants to discuss is Daenerys Targaryen marrying Khal Drogo. So, Var- Jorah has told Varys, Varys had sent a rider in the night um, to carry this message to Robert Baratheon. And this really makes me question like the validity of Illyrio and Varys and Aegon because Illyrio arranged this marriage. Illyrio and Varys are working together like we discovered that later on that Illyrio and Varys are working together. So why do you have a spy and why are you informing on her to the king if you give a fuck what happens to her? keeping up appearances i have always i don't want to get i i truly believe that george had a little bit of a change of heart uh with fagon um to be honest with you i think that the the whole Varys motivation thing got a little deeper i wouldn't say it changed completely but i think that at this point he didn't really view Aegon as as much of a uh protagonist or whatever not protagonist but you get what i mean I think they needed to rid the world of Daenerys and Viserys in order for yeah, that's a valid Aegon's point. in order for Aegon's claim to be acknowledged. But when Daenerys had dragons, she became useful, yeah. and 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 they backtracked, and now they want Daenerys to marry Aegon or whatever. But Robert is pissed off. He's worried about this. Um, and Ned's kind of... He, he's not. He's like, Daenerys Targaryen has wed some Dothraki horse lord. What of it? Like, shall we give her a wedding gift? And Robert has a gift in mind, and it's a knife. Which sounds nice. It sounds nice, but it's not. And that's the thing. He wants to kill Jorah, but he doesn't want to kill these Targaryen. That is such a big red flag for a first-time reader or viewer, right? I mean is Ned's duty, but I mean, for all intents and purposes, she has now married Kel Drogo, who has a formidable army with him, Kelzar. 
I think that. But I don't think is. I don't really think it's a contradiction because you have to look at it this way. So Jora is his bannerman, like that's his vassal, mm-hmm. and he's a grown ass man selling slaves where it's forbidden. So he's br- broken this Westerosi law, and Ned is all about law. Yeah. And following the law, like we see in the prologue, he cut, I mean, in the, in brand one, he cuts a man's head off for deserting the night's watch. So, I mean, I guess it's not Daenerys treason a, for, yeah, she's, she's a different, she's a different thing altogether. She's 13 years old. She's a, like, he sees her as a child. He sees her as the same age as John, the mm-hmm. same or, or younger than John, and like it, he sees his own daughter, like Sansa. Like this is a child. It, it's not a grown man. This is a a child. But I do get the, I do get the like the double layer of, yeah, he is really protective of these Targaryens. He's really lenient. When it comes to the Targaryens, but also, it's not treason. Like, you're right, though. I mean, they're not on Westerosi land. You know, I mean, he's not. He doesn't hold a title of any sorts. So the intention to come into, I guess, I mean, technically, isn't a crime. I mean, if Ned is such a, a moralist, there, you know, I guess, you know, really, because he, he says, if they come, we'll kill him. If they right. come, and he's being Ned is being a realist. Like the odds, I get it. Like. She's marrying a Dothraki horse lord. He, she's marrying a call, and she'll be a Khaleesi, and she'll have a Kalasar. But like Not in the big, for crossing seas. the big picture, like their horses aren't going to swim to <laughs> to Westeros, like. Overall, it's really not that big of a threat. But Ned, you know, he he says. Um, he, he's not surprised by the way that Robert acts about it because Robert's hatred of the Targaryens was a madness in him. He remembered the angry words they had exchanged when Tywin Lannister had presented Robert with the corpses of Rhaegar's wife and children as a token of fealty. Ned had named that murder. Robert called it war. So because Tywin came late to Robert's side, in order to win his loyalty, he had Rhaegar's children and wife killed, which he denies that he had them killed. Like, he denies he gave that order, by the way. And um, Ned is like, this is fucking murder. Like, what the hell? And you, like, you just killed babies. And Robert's like, I see no babies only dragons spawn and like they had this big argument and ned leaves and we know like after that argument after that argument about killing lannister babies we find out later like that's after that is when the tower of joy shit happened and he took john there's the argument see my understanding was and and please correct me if i'm wrong is that was the argument that they didn't talk. That was the point of separation uh, for Ned. I, right. Th- so I know that then it's a Greyjoy rebellion. So the Tower of Joy, because no. after the Trident in which um, Robert is injured in, Ned needs to go and take the forces to King's Landing. They expect the siege only to find the doors open by 12,000 Lannister troops in which the Mountain commits this atrocious act. So, so the Tower of Joy happens. I was always under. After under that. After that. Okay. Yeah, so it happens after that. Like, the only thing that reconciles Robert and Ned is Liana's death. Got you. And the grief that they shared over her passing. That's what brings them back together. But after that argument about killing Lan- killing Targaryen babies, Ned goes to find that his sister has her own Targaryen baby. So that's kind of what, like, if... The Targaryen kids had not been killed. What would Ned have done when he got John? Would he have still kept it a secret? Probably. Because he knew his friend was crazy. 
because they double down too. Robert, when he doesn't find that to be enough when he's observing Ned during this conversation, which we speak of, within the context of this dialogue, he brings up, then he doubles down with his backup. Well, remember what they did to Brandon and your father, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like, oh, that wasn't, because Robert's all about that was part of war. He's just, it's under the umbrella of war. Red's, you know, Ned's saying that it, it is murder. It is not under the umbrella of war. And then we get the double down of what happened to your father. I mean, because there's always that argument, and let's not get into it here, about what started the rebellion. Was it Liana or was it, uh, you know, Rickard and Brandon <laughs> being brutally Definitely. tortured? It was a it was a chain of yeah. things. It wasn't just one thing. Absolutely. But in this chapter... Um, he uses it in this chapter. He uses it as his one of his counterpoints, his big counterpoints, to gain Ned. Because Ned is trying to tell him, like, you know, this is an innocent child. Step back. Like, the, this is an innocent, this is, this is a little girl. And um, Robert's like, how long will this one remain innocent? And Ned is like, the murder of children, it would be vile unspeakable and then robert baratheon flips that shit on ned like what aries did to your brother motherfucker that was unspeakable like yeah so robert does that robert but robert has points though no robert that's my like i wanted to ask you personally because i actually although i'm with ned in sentiment here like pragmatically i'm with robert in this situation like you kill in, especially in this feudalistic age. Oh, my God. Yeah, I would. I'm sorry. And I'm not a terrible person. But that would I actually have empathy, I would say, for Robert here. A lot of empathy. Um, I think it's the right move. I. She's gaining if it, a Kazar. If he was having that conversation, if if Robert was having that conversation with anybody else other than Ned. They would have agreed with him. Yeah. Except for Barristan. Barristan Selmy might have disagreed because he disagrees with it later on. But like Varys, Renly, Stannis, all of them all of them would have agreed with Robert because it's escaping an issue in the in the future. Like a potent, yeah, a potential issue, but the potential of that issue goes from maybe even if it's 30% or even 10% to 0%. But and you it, have to like look at it from Ned's point. Like Ned no, has I a do. horse in this he like he has a horse in this race. Other than just it being children, like he ha- he has a whore. Like he doesn't. He's disgusted that the hound kills the butcher's boy, but he's not as disgusted with the hound. Like he he's he doesn't express it. He doesn't really do anything about it. Well, it, and that's what I think the red herring is here, you know, that Ned's change of position. So, you know, there's such a contrast be, between Jorah, even though we agree that under Northern, you know, under his law, under the law in which he is ordered to, you know, because they pretty much all own land rented from the king in a feudal landscape, and they have to go and then pay the king taxes. Like, so they have to hold law. He's pretty much for all intents and purposes, king of the north. He does what he has to need to do. And that, but this, this definitely, if you're reading this for the first time, Ned is showing his cards. Yeah, he is. He's showing he his cards is. here. He definitely is. And it's the, um, when, when Robert says, I will kill every Targaryen I can get my hands on until they are as dead as their dragons. And then I will piss on their graves. Um, Ned says, you can't get your hands on this one, can you? So, who is he talking about? Is he talking about John or is he I talking know. about Daenerys, or both? I thought that, too. It's so hyperbolic, what Robert says, but at the same time, it's like, man, is he goading him? Like, for real? <laughs> like, you've got this guy that needs to be, like, chained it. Like, he needs to be run in. Robert, that's what John Aaron did, supposedly. That was his use. Ned is, for all intents and purposes, supposed to be the new John, which isn't great. By the way, John is named after John Aaron, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Ned takes this opportunity to say, you know, well, like the Dothraki are like even a million Dothraki aren't a threat to us. But if they cross, we'll throw them back into the sea. But he uses it as like an opening 
to say once you choose a new warden of the east so there's this whole thing going on between robert and ned where ned feels like robert aaron should be the lord of the vale and the warden of the east which i think is stupid (laughs) oh sweet robin like sweet imagine sweet robin being the warden of the east and in control like he's batshit crazy he still breastfeeds like he's a sickly boy so i totally agree with robert on this like no he should and ned is like well it's the honorable thing to do like that's john aaron's son that's john aaron's title and robert's like you know what he's gonna be lord of the eerie and that's it yeah well, well, there's several factors playing into this, because just remember the big catalyst going into this scene, or this chapter, is the, you know, idea that L- Liza has sent them word that the Lannisters are against them. So he looks at that as more of an ally. Of course, there is even that relation, the, the big relationship, that father figure, that surrogate father figure that John is to him. And also the fact of we're just assuming the causality that we know happens, meaning the war, it is not uncommon for a sickly, a weak, or a young child to ha- take, you know, any type of leadership in a time of peace in this feudalistic landscape. So, saying that you have to have a battle commander there, or somebody that's battle ready, uh, George faces this problem as we see, because about all, in it's not a problem for his story in most aspects, it fits well with Rob, right? All these people that become leaders, in, in leaders of armies in the next year, are, are about three years out from, like, probably at least where they should be, right? Like, for not being questioned. Not saying that they don't get it done. And that's kind of, like, their journey, and it, it's not kind of it is. You know, that's where the, the story comes into its best. It's like, Robin is still a little young. But Robin not is just, not Rob. Robin is not, not Rob. It's not just his age. <laughs> I know. I'm. Let me finish before you crush me on this. Robin is not Rob. But how much does Ned know? And it's also a thing of he's stopping where you're getting to Jamie. And he's wondering how much right. do the Lannisters own your ass by now. Ned is the honor bound fool. Like he wants Rob, but Ned makes a good fucking point. Ned is like name Stannis, Warden of the East. Name Stannis, which is makes so much like Stannis is a proven military commander. Robert is freaking out because. The Targaryens are climbing in bed with the Dothraki and he doesn't want to rest a quarter of the realm to sickly Robert Aaron. So why not name your brother? Like, why does he dislike Stannis so much? Stannis is such the, the man. I'm such a Stan. If I've said on the record that if they were just to finish the books in one paragraph saying Stannis <laughs> fixes everything. And it's all right. Like, I'm with it. Like, I mean, yeah. like, it gets I mean, harder after Shireen. But yeah, no, you're right. Because he, and he brings up Storm. He, this is such a good, it's an exposition drop, but it's such a good, like, counterpoint as well, right? It's like cross. Yeah, like, it, ma- it makes you, like, okay, well, yeah, Ned Stark is really talking some sense. Like, he's saying put in a, a proven Storm's military end. commander. But at the same time, like, isn't we he Admiral know of the Fleet? Who? Stannis has a title at this point within the council well he's 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 lord of dragonstone no but he's he left he left the council he left okay gotcha. he left he, he rolled out which is a bad point on stannis like he, stannis knows more of what's going on than robert does and for him to just roll out and leave his brother there to get killed is also like some fuck shit too like that's not okay either and we could talk about that on something else. Like, I yeah, guess I'm sorry. I just organically came to that. I'm sorry. I was like legitimately asking, and now that brings up uh, thus again another counterpoint for this <laughs> debate there. <laughs> so it's not easy on any side. No, it's not. But Stannis is a proven warrior, and see, Ned didn't fucking tell Robert. I got this letter that says the Lannisters killed John Aaron. Why is no one upfront about shit? In this story, like, this is your friend, your brother, and you don't tell him what's in this letter. You don't warn him 
about what's in this letter, you're going to try to clumsily get to the bottom of this shit yourself in a place that you're not familiar with. Like, you're not Craig and Stark. You're not coming down there after the Dance of Dragons and no Hour of the Wolf type shit. Like, that's not you. And I feel like Ned, in this so- chapter, kind of shows his hand. I, I'm so it, it, it's so true though. I mean, Catelyn, first off, who you hate, and I'm not a big fan of, is like you're preaching to the choir, sister, because you know he also doesn't tell his wife, and he takes the grief for that. But also, like you know, I'm, I'm talking about John. But in this situation, you're right. It's like he, he shows like a true friendship when you withhold something like that, that brotherhood, that sisterhood, whatever you want to call it these days. It doesn't matter. That's a betrayal of it. I, I'm with you 100%. Him not showing that to him. But <laughs> if, I, you, <laughs> if you got a letter, if you got a letter or a fucking DM from <laughs> some from somebody. It's going to be likely said, a letter. Well, I'm going to kill Gray Area. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go, hmm, I'm going to sit on this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to stop it. <laughs> she might be bought out by uh, something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I just don't understand. Like, What was the worst that could happen if he told him he didn't have to say where it came from he didn't have to implicate lisa mm, yeah it's your it, it, yeah it just shows and that's where he's probing about jamie becoming you know warden of the east which kind of gets dropped in the index it's still there i checked into it but that's why he's kind of probing and he's kind of really his agenda is questioning the lannisters behavior in the past up until this point yeah. because they are opportunistic and they bought their way in Plain and simple. I mean, isn't it a little bit ideal to lose the least amount of people but have the most amount to gain from a a war? I mean, the the, Ned was already predisposed against the land. Like he already had a predis a predisposition. Ned already had a predisposition against them because they killed Targaryen children, and Ned is housing a Targaryen child. So he already had this thing against them so when Lysa adds fuel to the fire like don't trust them they conspired to kill John Aaron um or the queen conspired to kill John Aaron Ned has you know reason to not like Jamie and he already didn't like Jamie for something that I feel is stupid like I get why Ned doesn't like Jamie right he killed the king he was supposed to protect but at the same time, Ned doesn't like know what we know. It's like smudging the paperwork. Know. It's like smudging the paperwork in that situation, too. Like, it really is. It's like, oh, because Rob brings it up to him. Again, this is kind of a nice, like, debate between these two. And this is, like, getting to the end of the chapter. But it really is. It's like, you know, uh, on surface value, you can look be- at, like, some silly rhetoric. But it's, you know, some pretty valid points. Like, they were going to, what, Ned was going to siege King's Landing with, with the forces, and, and they were going to kill, you know, if they probably would have had the opportunity. But since Jamie had sworn an oath, you know, as we you'll get to in other episodes and stuff like that, then it was like, oh, that that's taboo. Right. Like, it's all these like technicalities, like yeah. none of this pragmatic sense. And he almost shows his hand as a little bit of a, a pragmatic fool in that sense. But, you know, it's very it's very frustrating to look at still. And that's what's so good about it. I, mean- I get frustrated talking about it. That's what Ned, like, that's what Ned is. Ned is all about honor and doing things honorably and oaths and loyalty. And Jamie broke that code, which it is taboo. Because at this point, we don't know that the Mad King was going to burn the city. Ned doesn't know that. And a lot of this chapter, in my opinion, is about when it comes to Jamie, it's kind of throwaway shit, right? So George did the outline, the original outline. He had submitted it with the first 13 chapters, which included this chapter. And in that original outline, like George's plan was to have Jamie kill everyone that came before him to usurp the throne. So when Ned goes on about riding down the throne room and seeing Jamie sitting on the throne and he had no right to sit on the throne and the lion flying above King's Landing, like definitely that was foreshadowing for his original story, what he was originally going to do. But at the same time, it also works in another way, whereas... Ned has like that 
reason to me is bullshit. Like Ned bringing that up like it's some aha moment is bullshit. Like it, it, it's not, it's, it's really not an aha moment. It's really nothing that should make Robert care that he sat on the throne. Like who gives a fuck? It does stick though with Ned's like very stringent standards because also Ned is not shaming the Night King or not the Night King, the King Eris for, mm-hmm. for burning. Yeah, the Night King. He, well, he doesn't. That's a fact. <laughs> he doesn't because he is not aware of his existence and he's not. Because he doesn't exist. He, he doesn't exist in the books. I know. I just said it. All right. But anyways, but he's not shaming uh, Eris, the Mad King for like what he did to his brother either. So he's kind of like sticking to the, the line on that one. Uh, the only issue I have with that is silly as it might seem as I reread this chapter multiple times was that hanging of the Lannister banner of Bub King's Landing it really stuck for, in my craw for some reason. Like, I'm not going to get in Shrivalric Law or anything like that, but it, that would be a big issue if he's claiming it for Robert. Like, that is a power move. And I mean, I know we all know that, but like the yeah. one thing, like, I actually don't have an issue with him sitting in the chair, anything like that, you know, it, but for some reason, not putting the stag. But maybe me. they didn't. Maybe they didn't have the stag. Like, yeah, why they would they just be carrying asses, around a Baratheon at, banner? They, they, but then not having it is such an issue. But uh, go ahead. Yeah, but, yeah that's just. <laughs> but I mean, I get issue. it. Like, it is a big thing. They shouldn't have put any banner. They should have left the Targaryen banner <laughs> there until this. Till this people with the stag banners well, got where's there. Where's the to be decided? But I definitely think like that was some foreshadowing of Jamie being, you know, cutting his yeah. way to the throne and taking the throne eventually. Thank God. But that didn't I do love that that didn't happen because I love Jamie fucking Lannister. Mm-hmm. I love his character arc. It's amazing because he shows the contradiction in this argument. He he plays both side of it. You know, that's why he's used as the primary example. In this debate that we just got done talking about, like, it, Jamie is the example, and he lived it. Yeah. It's a, it's a mean, paradox. Jamie's, it's a paradox. It's a paradoxical life in, in which he lives. So, you know, sometimes you gotta lose a hand to give a hand. Uh, but I, I mean, this, this is one of the least changed, at least in its, uh, you know, actual context of this chapter to the show. I think that if I didn't get my hands on this, I have it uh, saved somewhere old computer the whole uh, all the scripture uh, game of thrones the series mm-hmm. this is very much so true at least in the show um i think they do honor this for the most part they exclude the warden of the east and all that which is understandable um and like i said betsy to betsy but you know i think it's uh, pretty fair to say that this is a pretty truthful adaption at least uh, one yeah. of you but it's I, it's I mean, so hard to deal with though. It's still living back through it. It's just as fun as it is frustrating. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is frustrating to see like Ned Ned in the fucking crypts. Robert doesn't listen to him. He he doesn't care what he says. He disregards everything he says. On this trip, the whole trip, not just this chapter, he doesn't listen to Ned. So Gets Ned worse. is definitely making the wrong decision by going off to King's Landing. Ned is an honorable guy and nobody that he's playing against has honor, <laughs> like not a shred. And Robert basically, you know, alludes to this, but he uses the wrong example. So he's like, you know, go down in your crypts and ask Liana about the dragon's honor, which Ned should have t- taken heed to because while Robert thinks that Liana was raped and all of this stuff, and maybe she was. We still don't know. I, I don't think so, but we it's not clear. Um, but Rhaegar wasn't honorable because Rhaegar was a married man with children that he abandoned to go fuck this lady. So he we, we can't sit here and say, you know, Rhaegar Targaryen was an honorable person. So even if Ned views him... As this guy that he doesn't think visits brothels and whatever. He he views Rhaegar in a good light. But he did defile your sister. Like, he he did. Yeah, and there could have been a lot done. I mean, it's constantly brought up about, you know, 
how Ned in some later chapters tell tales out of school. But I mean, we all know. I mean, he, he I wouldn't say he views him in a good light, but he definitely does not have any disdain for him, or at least overt disdain. And that's that's problematic within Ned's code, but it just shows and it humanizes Ned because he ties him to the reason in which his sister died, and he has to think that's for a reason, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and it is, everybody has a code. Robert's code is one of lust and romance. <laughs> as cheesy as it is, but he abides by that code, right? And he's going to kill every last one of those cheesemongers. Uh, but it's Ned's code is, is obviously not ideal for anything, and it's problematic, and it, it's got a lot of conflicts within it. And in this chapter is such a, it is literally like just two best friends that haven't seen each other in nine years that have the world in their hands together going on this diatribe right this in this complete debate it's into called, foreshadowed doom like they're everything yeah they're they're riding right into doom and like as they go as their conversation goes and as unsuccessful as a conversation as it is like we see that this isn't going to work. You know immediately. You knew in Ned 1, but you really know in Ned 2 that, that like, this relationship, like, this is this is scary. Like, these, these Starks going to the capital is scary because the king isn't on their side. The, the, he's not on their side. He's siding with the Lannisters at every... Turn like when when Ned tells him, Robert is like he roars with laughter, and he's like, "Well, now I know Jamie's dark sin. The matter can be forgotten." Yeah, we know Jamie's true dark sin at the moment. Man, why wouldn't oh, if Ancestry dot com would have been a thing during these days? How how could Robert look at his kids and be like, "Yo, those are Baratheons." Yeah, well, those are definitely Baratheons. Yeah, but it 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 hey. Uh, you know, but that gene, that that blonde hair, blue eyed gene, I guess is really strong. But it is, it is a very even knowing what we know now. And I don't know if you've dealt with any of the still Ashara, you know, and Ned like believers and pushers. I don't get that. I think the books will stick to R plus L equals J because it's kind of like the, the hint, the whole story hinges on that. It's insane totally... to me. But the context is there at the beginning. Yeah, I totally think that. R plus L equals J is the equation, but I get why people don't necessarily buy into it because there is a lot of smoke screening done mm -hmm. to R plus L equals J for Ashara and Ned equals John. And then when the show, which I hate talking about the show on this podcast, but when the show made Jon Snow his parentage really didn't mean anything. Like it was just like a plot device to make Daenerys crazy. Cause yeah. her nephew wouldn't like murder her vagina. Like that's basically <laughs> what it was used for. Yeah, so not murdering vaginas. I, I get why avid book readers were like, what the fuck? So if they already believed N plus a equals J, then I could totally see why they still believe it because yeah, it was, it was handled fucking terrible but i don't want to talk about that <laughs> i don't want to get too far in that uh, yeah it, just to end it for me is all i want to say is that like reading these and separating myself from what i know i'm if you had to ask me to like analyze this from just the context you know just what's read it nothing about the biographical meaning what george has been through or anything looking at this from the you know the, the straight old looking at what's on the paper what am I going to take from it? The context says Ashara and Ned all day long, all yeah. day long. I, I, that is not what's going to happen. But, but that's not, that's not how George writes. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't no, but that's what makes tell you something straightforward. Yeah. But, but at the time, if you, that's all you had to work off of, it would tell you that that would work yeah. out. I but mean, I'll tell you what this, this chapter does, right? It, I want to read this. So Robert is like tired of this whole fucking conversation. He doesn't want to hear about Jamie anymore. He doesn't want to hear about not killing Dragon Spawn anymore. He doesn't want to hear about Jorah. Nothing. He just is like, you know what? I want to feel the wind in my hair again. And he just rides off. And Ned just is sitting there. And he's just like, he doesn't have words. And he's filled with a vast sense of helplessness. 
And he says, not for the first time, he wondered what he was doing here and why he had come. He was no John Aaron to curb the wildness of his king and teach him wisdom. Robert would do what he pleased, as he always had, and nothing Ned could say or do would change that. He belonged in Winterfell. He belonged with Catelyn in her grief and with Bran. A man could not always be where he belonged, though. Resigned, Eddard Stark put his boots into his horse and set off after the king. So Ned is just like lost. Like he doesn't know why he's there. He knows he doesn't belong there. And he's known it since the last chapter. Like Ned doesn't want to, Ned didn't want to go to King's Landing. Like Catelyn talked him into it. Maester Lewin talked him into it. He didn't want to go. He had made up his mind. He wasn't going. And now like every stop, every Eddard chapter is red flags as to why he shouldn't be there and he already knows like there's nothing he can do to stop robert from doing what he wants to do robert's always ahead of him he's ahead of him even on his steed he is this big fat old dude bobby b and and ned can't keep up with him you know like and then as you just uh, you know excellently uh quoted he sits there and he puts his feet back into the set you know into his uh his the whatever the hell they're called i don't ride horses but he uh puts his feet back in and, and he goes, and th- at this point, because you had 10 Ned chapters, right? All together. Mm-hmm. And that sets up our whole story. For those yeah. 10 chapters, that is the the foundation of this story as a whole. When he puts his feet back in those saddles, so does everybody else. So does Rob. The only person that separates is John. once he gets to the wall, kind of goes in a different way. But he wouldn't have gone to the wall if he didn't think Benjamin could have been a father figure and all this. All this is brilliantly set up by the gardener. When it, when you want to talk about how great George R. R. Martin is, this is one of those chapters that, that people should look at. Because it really is, metaphorically and within the context, literally is brilliant. And it really sets our story just off. And, and I couldn't enjoy reading it as much as I thought I ever could. Like I said, you brought me back. The show <laughs> put me out, but it's true. And if any time we need, you know, to be reinvigorated by this text, it's now because we don't necessarily have a show to look forward to. The books will come if they come and when they come, hopefully yes. soon. But at the same time, you can still enjoy, if I can still enjoy the hell out of this, and I, I live that YouTuber life where it's like, well, what I read isn't boring, so I'm going to make videos out of it, which is silly. But, you know, at the same time, it's like a big decision for me to read something again, and I'm loving it. I'm reinvigorated by you. The Long Night Juice has spread it in you, Justin. And this podcast is the excellent companion piece. I don't know if this episode will be, but I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, but all of this chapter is basically setting up or further establishing the relationship between Ned and Robert and Ned doing basically what he thinks he has to do because honor, he's told Robert that he's going to do it. He's honor bound to try to protect him, but he knows that he can't do it. And he knows that he doesn't belong there. And it's going to be a repeating cycle throughout every Ned Stark chapter. But he'll be beheaded just like Will was with ice who knew he shouldn't have been where he was. So yeah. The cycle never stops. But that's Eddard 2. And I want to thank everybody for watching. Do you want to let them know where they can find you one more time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Top Shelf Fandom. And uh, I I just, guys, I'm happy to be on here. I'm such a fan of uh, this podcast. And it's really helping me get through uh, these low times and and refine something that I was so in love with. So Top Shelf Fandom. And and you can follow me on on any of the various uh, social media links in which I obtain at the moment. So thank you so much for having me on, Gray. It's an honor and a pleasure as always. You're welcome. As always, thanks for listening to the Obsidian Nights podcast. I will see you next week.